So this talk is Layer Parallel Training of Deep Residual Networks. This is me, Jacob Schroeder, but I, of course, did this work with a number of collaborators. And I put Stephanie Gunter in bold because she was the one who really spearheaded this effort. So I just want to give a little shout out here on the first slide to that. So an outline for this talk. First, why do we need more parallelism? And then connect deep residual learning with optimal control. And then we'll look at layer parallelization via multigrid in time for optimal control. And then last, we'll do some numerical results. So you've seen this plot or similar plots quite a bit this week. Our need for parallelism comes from the fact that computer architectures are changing. Here you can see in yellow that compute power transistors continues to increase, but in green, the frequency is stagnated and all this extra compute power is from increases in number of cores in black. So to take advantage of current and future architectures, we need new sources of parallelism. And that's why we consider parallel in time. Now the application here is deep residual learning. And at the top, I have a sample um, neural network where you have wide data as some input. It could be a picture of, of a dog or a cat or a dog on a skateboard. And those pixel values um, can then go into the input layer. And then you have weight matrices depicted by the arrows that transfer information from the input layer to layer one. And then you have another weight matrix that transfers information to layer two and so on until you get to the output layer. Then you have your network output YN and you compare that to an expected output C data. And C data will tell you what class or what group you want your input to be classified as. C data could just be a binary vector indicating what classification you want an image to be. More specifically, we can define resonant propagation with respect to a weight matrix at layer N, a bias vector at layer N, and then the state vector at layer N. And then we consider classified training as having an input-output pair, Y data being, say, the image inputted, and C data telling you what class that should be put in. And then your input image becomes your initial condition, in a sense. And then you have a layer propagation formula that takes your state at layer N plus some update gives you the state at layer N plus one. And this update is the standard update for a neural network where you take a weight matrix, multiply it by your current state, and add a bias term, which is a bit like a forcing term. And then F here represents the activation function. It could be a sigmoid or a ReLU, or you know, there's many options here. And so this is the forward network propagation, but of course we want to solve the learning problem. We want to minimize the loss. So the loss measures how far your network output is from the expected output. And you want to minimize the loss over all possible weights and biases. So if you add an artificial time parameter to the equation from the previous slide, so you add this H parameter here, you can see that ResNet propagation looks exactly like an explicit Euler discretization. And it's an explicit Euler discretization for this forward in time ODE where your state is now a function in time, your weights are a function in time, as are your biases. And so ResNet propagation is just a discretization of this ODE. And if you go through these references at the bottom by Haber, Ruthodo, and Wynan, you'll see that uh, ResNet backpropagation, the classic training algorithm for neural networks, is the same as the discrete adjoint method commonly used in optimal control problems. And so ResNet training is equivalent to an optimal control problem where the constraint is a forward in time ODE and you're trying to minimize the loss for your network. And the control parameters are your weights, which are now a function of time, and your biases, which are also a function of time. And you're beginning to see now how one could apply a parallel in time scheme to this. So one more notational simplification. Let's take our explicit Euler time stepping from the previous slide and just denote that by a phi operator. That'll just be our layer propagation operator going from layer n to layer n plus one. 
we'll do one other notational simplification where we take all of our network parameters, our weights and our biases, and lump them into a theta n. So then we have three steps for training the network. We want to solve the ODE, which is forward propagation. Here you can see the initial condition, then you propagate forward, 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 forward. So you get your state at some layer n, yn. And this is the forward in time ODE, where we've described our explicit Euler discretization now as a phi parameter, as the phi operator. Now after forward propagation, you have to do back propagation to train the network. The initial condition here is the derivative of your loss function at your final time. That's your initial condition for the back propagation. And you take the adjoint of your time stepping operator and propagate your adjoint variable. So note here that y has a bar on top of it, which is a common notation to denote the adjoint variable. And you propagate the adjoint variable backwards. Um, and that, if you're familiar with optimization methods, this adjoint variable is what, is what then allows you to compute your updates to your network parameters. Um, if you boil it all down, the adjoint variable allows you to compute um, your gradient with respect to the network parameters of your loss function. And your alpha is your weight, your learning rate, which you use to sort of accelerate or decrease the rate at which you change your network parameters. So that's a brief overview of connecting deep residual learning and optimal control. Um, and I did a description there that was pretty algorithmic in the sense so that you can see the main costs are forward in time and backward in time propagations, which presumably one could apply a parallel in time scheme to. And that's exactly what we do. We have a nonlinear system forward in time to be solved, where the initial condition y0 is our data. And then at each subsequent time point, we have to solve this little equation, where essentially y1 is equal to the forward propagation from y0, yi is equal to the forward propagation from yi minus 1. So this is the nonlinear system which we solve. But just as motivation to see what's really going on, consider this simpler linear problem. And if you take this nonlinear equation and just for simplicity's sake, assume that phi is linear, you get this system on the bottom that you saw in Masumi's talk and many other talks, where you have an identity on the diagonal and phi on the subdiagonal. And sequential layer propagation simply solves this system sequentially with forward substitution. We apply multigrid reduction to solve this system iteratively. Um, as you've seen from Misumi's and other talks, we coarsen only in layer dimension, which is coarsening only in the time dimension. And that means we don't coarsen inside of the phi operator, which gives the method its non-intrusiveness similar to parareal and, and some other parallel in time methods, meaning you can reuse your existing time stepping schemes. Just as a reminder, both the multigrid and sequential time stepping are O of n, um, but multigrid is highly parallel, but with a higher computational constant in front of the n. So the two-level multigrid and time algorithm, let's consider that we have a fine grid. So here we denote time point t0, t1, all the way up to tn. But these time points, again, are also layers in your network. So then you coarsen that fine grid by a factor of m. So you coarsen your time points, you coarsen your layers to create a coarse grid. And here we've skipped, we've removed this time point and this time point and this time point and this time point to create a coarser grid. And multigrid in time iterates between this fine grid and coarse grid. And we use what's known as FAS or full approximation storage which is a nonlinear multigrid cycling scheme. That is a, a pretty powerful general nonlinear solver. And multigrid in time has three basic steps. The first one is to approximate your solution on the fine grid, improve your approximation. There we do that through relaxation. So we do this FC relaxation that you've seen in parallel. And FC relaxation is just local applications of your time stepping operator which you can carry out in parallel. Then you have to solve a residual equation on your coarse grid. 
And in the two grid setting, this residual equation on the coarse grid is, called, is solved sequentially. And so here, this denotes the coarse grid time propagator, this H sub C. Once you solve the residual equation on the coarse grid, you can interpolate. So that's this red arrow, red arrow, red arrow. And that adds an error correction at the C points, at these coarse points on the fine grid. And then these arrows here denote an update at these F points, at these intermediate points, so that the error, propagate, error correction here gets propagated to this point and this point. And if this is done recursively, you can have a full multi-level solve. And again, we're talking about time points here, but each time step is a layer in your network. So for the next slide, we're going to introduce another notational simplification where we're going to take our network state at every layer. So this is a network state at layer one, dot, 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 network state at layer n, stack those all into one big vector, which we call bold y. So bold y is just your state at every layer. And we denote one multigrid in time iteration with an h operator. So this is your solution after k multigrid in time iterations. And this is your solution after k plus one multigrid in time iterations. So network state after k m grid iterations, network state after k plus one m grid iterations. And if you let k go to infinity and you have a convergent multigrid iteration, yn will approach the solution from serial propagation. And what we've done now is we're computing the network state in parallel over the layers. And like you've seen in the other talks, if the number of layers and the number of cores are sufficiently large, and that's problem dependent, you can expect a parallel speed up. Now, if you're used to um, machine learning, you've, you're familiar with the uh, concept of data parallelization. And that's what's depicted here at the top. Is let's say you have one image here of a dog on a skateboard, and then a different image of a dog on a skateboard. And you can take, say, two GPUs, and here at the top, take one GPU to do a forward propagation of this image, and then take your other GPU and do a forward propagation of this image. And the networks are glued together with this computation of the loss from both networks. And then with this sort of joint loss computation, you're able to then do a backwards propagation in parallel through both networks. And what we've done is we've added a new dimension of parallelism that allows you to split up along the layer dimension. There's absolutely no reason you couldn't use layer parallelism in conjunction with data parallelism. As you saw in David's very nice talk, uh, we use the XBraid code um, to do our layer parallelization. You have to write a few functions to use XBraid. In particular, you have to tell XBraid how to step forward in time. There's also a my step adjoint that tells you how to step backwards in time with the adjoint variables. And you have to define a few other sensible things like what your loss function is and how to do some basic linear algebra, like create a new vector, do an AXP, and measure the size of a vector. So putting this all together, we have forward propagation. We do that with a parallel multigrid solve. So this is our notation for a parallel multigrid solve, where we just take our network state from iteration k and move it to iteration k plus 1. And that's the same thing as this ODE, which we saw previously. Back propagation, again, is just an ODE with an initial condition at the final time, and then a time propagation equation that goes backwards in time. So you go from time step n plus 1 to time step n. But that's just an upper bidiagonal system. There's no way, there's no reason why you can't use mgrid in this setting as well. So we use an mgrid solver h to take our adjoint variable y bar and update it to y bar k plus 1. And so this just repeats what we already saw for 1 and 2. Here, you let k go to infinity to recover your network state um, that you would get from serial propagation. Here, h again is doing your m grid iterations. That allows you to compute your network loss, how far away your network output is from the expected output. Then you can do back propagation, letting k go to infinity. 
and you get the same adjoint variable as you would from sequential time propagation. And then you can compute the gradient of your loss function with respect to the network parameters. And just for detail's sake, that's the equation for that. And then we do a simple gradient um, descent method to take our network parameters and update them based on a learning rate alpha times the gradient of the loss function. And you repeat this for many training data inputs. And that's simple gradient descent. Now you're probably thinking we don't need to go all the way out to infinity or to very large k to get back the solution from sequential time propagation. We can probably halt this early for a certain k. Now how small can that k be? Can k be 10 or can k be 2 um, was a subject of some research. But what this means is that we then have inexact gradient information. And doing minimization or optimization with inexact gradients requires a little bit of extra work. And luckily, one of our collaborators, Nico Gauger, is uh, one of the developers of one-shot simultaneous optimization. So if you're not familiar with that, just think of it as an optimization method that is robust for inexact gradient information. And what it does is it inserts an approximate Hessian inverse, where in our experiments, we looked at um, limited memory BFGS or simply scaled identity matrices for this H inverse. But with this, in including some approximation to H inverse here, the method becomes robust for doing using inexact gradient information. Now, the last bit of algorithmic development was how do you initialize deep networks? Um, parallel in time, as you've seen in this workshop, is useful only if you have a fairly large number of time steps. Time step numbers in the hundreds, but maybe even the thousands before you see a benefit. And initializing deep networks with even tens of layers is a known difficult problem. And so we looked at um, using a nested iteration strategy to initialize our um, deep networks. And the overall idea here is to train on a course level and then interpolate your weights and biases to initialize the finer level. And in our experiments, we looked at uniform refinement in layer to create the next level, which is the same thing as just doing uniform refinement in time. We looked at a couple different interpolation strategies, piecewise constant and linear, and found that there was virtually no difference in our experiments. So we stuck with piecewise constant interpolation for the weights and biases. And in the bottom here, you see um, a full multigrid uh, nested iteration type diagram where you start here on the initial course network with 16 layers. And you would train this initial network with a few layers uh, with a classic sequential training algorithm. And then this red arrow represents the refinement and interpolation of those network weights and biases to this layer, this level here with 32 layers. And then this little V cycle here represents the parallel and layer training until you're happy with your 32 layer network here. You refine again to get a 64 layer network, interpolating your weights and biases from 32 layers to 64 layers and repeat some parallel and layer training sweeps to train your 64 layer network, repeat, and you can get 128 layer network or go up to you know, even into the thousands of layers. And so that covers the basic algorithmic components and a few numerical results that we've developed for this strategy, just ground testing it. We've looked at a few examples. This is the simplest example, which we can run on our desktops, um, where you have points in space but these fairly complex nonlinear regions that you have to capture with uh, your network to accurately classify the points. Test case three is the classic MNIST case, which many people are probably familiar with. These are nicely uh, cropped and uh, images of handwritten digits. And then this is the trickiest training set we have, which is hyperspectral image segmentation. From called the Indian Pines data set. And what this is, it's 220 images essentially, but each image is a different wavelength, a different spectral reflectance band for a plot of land in Indiana. 
And what you want to do in this problem is accurately classify each part of your image based on its land cover. So here's the image, and then you want to classify this area as, say, corn, this area as wheat, this area as a subdivision. You could see how this could be useful for quickly uh, computing how many acres of a particular crop are planted in a state. And the first thing we do is we do a weak scaling study for one gradient evaluation. So this isn't training yet. This is just one gradient evaluation with four layers per core. Um, and we saw the same basic results for all three examples. I just show MNIST and level sets here. So the magenta line is the weak scaling for the layer parallel, and the green is weak scaling for layer serial. Now the layer serial has no parallelism over number of layers. So as the x-axis, the number of layers increases, the runtime, or the y-axis, for layer serial increases, as expected. And the same thing happens for MNIST. And for the interest of time, I omitted the, some strong scaling plots, but th they're similarly uh, uh, look good. And this just shows you in the limit, as you go to large numbers of layers, you can get nice speed ups by using a layer parallel approach. And this slide looks at simultaneous training versus sequential training. So simultaneous training just refers to that one-shot optimization approach. We refer to it as simultaneous training because it's actually one iteration of the one-shot approach simultaneously updates the state adjoint and uh, network parameters. And so it's a simultaneous optimization approach. And in this case, in the image, you can compare the runtime against the training loss and validation accuracy, validation accuracy for the simultaneous layer parallel in magenta and the layer serial reference in, in green. And what you'll see is here, if you follow my mouse, the validation accuracy for layer serial and for layer parallel is the same, only you get to this nice validation accuracy much more quickly than you do for layer serial. And the same thing happens for the training loss in that the training loss for layer serial goes down quickly, but the training loss for layer parallel goes down um, similarly quickly, but in a much reduced compute time. And now you take the layer parallel gradient evaluations, wrap it inside of the overall network training. So you're now adding the steps to update the network weights that reduces the efficiency sum of the algorithm. And these were the sort of the best speed up numbers that we were able to generate using say 256 or 128 cores with certain numbers of layers in the network. And this last result slide looks at the multi-level initialization strategy. The headline number is, we found that nested iteration reduces training time by about 25%. Sorry, that was a, a brief interruption from my son, who's, who's here at home as well. Um, so nested iteration reduces training time by about 25%. Um, and in the red, you can see the validation accuracy increasing for non-nested iteration. And the uh, nested iteration is broken into three different levels, level zero, level one, and level two. And here you can see the validation accuracy on the first level of nested iteration. So this would be with 32 layers. Then you interpolate and are able to drive your uh, validation accuracy even higher with 64 levels. And now you're driving your validation accuracy higher with 128 levels. And this annotation here shows that you're able to reach the peak validation accuracy from non-nested iteration uh, 61.8 work units sooner. And a work unit, which I should have introduced um, earlier, but a work unit is just a normalized unit of time for one epoch of training without multi-level initialization. So the x-axis here is just sort of a normalized uh, uh, runtime axis, where each unit on the x-axis equals one epoch of training. And so this provides strong evidence that nested iteration can reduce training time. 
And we also found some evidence that nested iteration can reduce parameter sensitivity during training so that the training is less sensitive to things like the size of the Tikhonov regularization parameter or weight initializations. And so in summary, um, future speedups uh, will be available through increased concurrency. And this will lead, we believe, to a need for parallel and layer technologies. You can write an equivalence between residual network training and optimal control problem. And then we looked at layer parallelization via multigrid in time for optimal control. And we saw nonlinear multigrid solves that did the network propagation both forwards and backwards. And that simultaneous optimization allows for early stopping of the multigrid iterations and the use of inexact gradients. And then finally, we look at a nested iteration or multi-level initialization strategy for initializing deep networks. And overall, you can achieve a runtime reduction from added concurrency across layers. And that wraps up the talk. And I'd like to um, open the floor to any questions.